Mm-hmm. Good, good evening, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Hello, order. Ladies and gentlemen, the College Historical Society, ladies and gentlemen, it's my pleasure to call on the Pro Record Secretary uh, to read the minutes of the last inaugural meeting. The last inaugural session was held on the 24th of March uh, for, with the auditor Sebastian John Fulmer speaking for the inaugural of the 253rd session on the, on the importance of discourse in the modern day with the guests Rory Montgomery and Cody Keenan proposing the motions of thanks of the society which are due to the auditor for their paper and that the hist is worthy of support. These motions were seconded by the chair, Professor David McConnell, and they were passed. Ladies and gentlemen, if you have no objections uh, to my sign in these minutes, I will give my sign. presented uh, in oratory to eight members who spoke in the society Guinness World Record Marathon Debate. I think everybody here, or almost everybody here knows that in this last session, uh, the society organized a uh, debate which lasted for an extraordinary period of time in which uh, these eight members of the society participated and succeeded one another continuously for a very long 
period such that they were awarded the Guinness World Record in this. So all of them deserve an enormous uh, debt of gratitude and an honor uh, from the society for having achieved this signal event. So they are Ziad Anwar, Sebastian Dunfolmer, Tom Francis, Kevin Hammer, Kate Henshaw, Anna Savica, Daniela Williams, and Mary Woods. Chair, Ambassadors, Vice Provost, Vice Presidents and Friends of the College of Historical Society, ladies and gentlemen. Current day on all his arm of that and show no cliff, in a next line of Kemula show, Augustus Moore and Honor Dum of that Obelta Kerfulta Moore Rove Galaire. Since Sebastian addressed you last March, the Society has continued to build upon the strong foundations and successes of previous sessions. The College of Historical Society remains an institution both by and for students at the very heart of student life in Trinity. Throughout its 254th session, the HIST has continued to engage, encourage, and empower young people to promote and foster exceptional public discourse and debate, to build a community and a third space for generations of Trinity students, and to just keep winning Guinness World Records. Um, this year, we have held debates on topics as diverse as a constitu constitutional right to housing, Trinity's colonial legacies, and monogamy. We've had addresses from guest speakers ranging from former Prime Minister of New Zealand, Jacinda Ardern, to Hong Kong student activist, Nathan Law, to former Tory MP Rory Stewart. We continued the HIST long tradition with many landmark events. We gave a platform for a head-to-head -head between our Student Union President and our Taoiseach. We co-hosted a debate on whether the Republic has forgotten the North in Stormont's Senate chamber. And we even debated for 27 hours and 58 minutes straight once. But you can all be rest assured we're not trying to break that record again tonight. We've also held five internal competitions, two external competitions, and three schools competitions, many of which had record numbers competing and notably high standard of speakers. I'm barely scratching the tip of the iceberg with those achievements, but it is safe to say that the 254th session has been an exceptional one for the College Historical Society. With that in mind, I would like to say a few words of thanks before I begin my inaugural paper. First and foremost, to the General Committee for their exceptional hard work, enthusiasm, and support throughout the year. Behind every single one of those achievements, I mentioned is a team of talented and passionate students who I've had the pleasure of working with over the past 12 months. Just as the HIST shapes its members, its members shape the HIST. The culture and success of the society is a reflection of the many wonderful students who currently make up the society's general committee and ordinary membership. To our four very distinguished guests who are here this evening, it is an honour to have you and thank you very, very much for taking the time to join us. Not only is it an honour to be speaking alongside you, it's also a huge relief to be speaking first as you're all very daunting acts to follow. Um, to our chairperson this evening, Professor David McConnell, thank you very much for your unwavering commitment to the HIST. Um, I should note that David stepped down as president of the society in February this year after over two decades of incredible leadership and in typical David fashion has continued to go above and beyond in his support and advice ever since, even agreeing to chair this evening when our new president Mary Harney was unable to make it. To all of our other wonderful honorary members who provide so much support to the society, Adrian Langan, Ursula Quill, Ross Hines, Luke Fehley and Ted Smith are just a few of the honorary members who have be been so beyond gracious and encouraging with their time and advice over the course of the year. To my, to my family who have supported me um, throughout my time in the HIST, in particular to my dad who perhaps unintentionally impressed on me from a young age that there is nothing wrong with being a little bit argumentative. To all my friends, particularly those I have met during my time in the HIST and who continue to bring so much passion and joy to the society, as generations of students have done for centuries. 
I'm thrilled to be finishing my term as auditor knowing the society is in good hands. And now I turn to the topic of the inaugural address. Many countries have experienced mass migration over the centuries, resulting in significant populations of their descendants in other states. However, the Irish diaspora is distinguished by the disproportionate number of people of Irish descent outside Ireland, as opposed to in Ireland itself, and also the extent to which the diaspora has tended to retain their Irish identity while abroad. Even when there are several gen generations removed from Ireland, they still consider themselves to be 100% Irish, as Joe Biden and a less well-known Kennedy family than my own can attest to. My pers perspective on this issue stems from my own familial experience. While I've grown up in Dublin, my ancestors on my dad's side emigrated to New Zealand. The Kennedy line returned to Ireland when my dad met a woman from Cork in a bar in London, and I suppose the rest is history. He ended up returning to the old turf, if you will, and might be accordingly called a lapsed migrant. It sometimes seems that the understanding of Irishness abroad reflects a fossilised and romanticised view of Ireland. The Ireland our diaspora dreams of is the one that the individual emigrants left behind in nostalgic songs like Revenge for Skibbereen or Danny Boy. This may be in part because so, many Irish, so much Irish emigration was involuntary, caused by famine or economic necessity. It may also have been a reaction to the discrimination initially encouraged, encountered for so many emigrants in their new homes. Religion, education, and even the demographic of Irish emigrants all doubtless played a part too. However, part of the diaspora's community clutch on their Irishness was out of necessity. Many of them have coalesced around religion and culture and Irishness to gain social mobility. In any event, it appears their sense of Irishness often increased rather than decreased with distance from Ireland. It should also be remembered that there was a darker side to traditional Ireland, which these romanticisms tend to forget, particularly in its treatment of women. One of our most evocative speakers this year, Dr Maeve O'Rourke, spoke passionately about the horrors of mother and baby homes in Ireland. We must be honest about our past if we are truly going to put it to rest. For the descendant of those, descendants of those who stayed behind, our vision is a very different to Ireland to the romantic one in Hollywood movies or traditional songs. We take pride in our economic and social progress and aspire to being a modern and inclusive progressive European state, one that figures like Mary Robinson worked hard to build. Even though we still have a long way to go, we have come very far from the maidens dancing at the crossroads. Even if some of our returned diaspora might be disappointed to find that the Ireland their ancestors left has moved on. While the international vision of Ireland tended to focus on us as Gaelic Catholics, this was always a gross oversimplification, ignoring the influxes over the centuries, whether those were Vikings or Normans or Scots or many other groups. Of course, at the time of partition and for much of the 20th century, the vast majority of the population in the South were white and were Catholic, with an unhealthy symbiosis between church and state on both sides of the border. It is only in recent decades, post-EU membership, and as we attracted more immigration due to the Celtic Tiger, that we became less monocultural to the benefit of us all. Irish society has been enriched by the return of Irish people who lived and worked abroad. Such, such, mig uh, such migrants have a vision of a more inclusive society, less dominated by religion and greater equality for all. It has been enriched by the new Irish, meaning that while there is still work to be done, we are far more diverse than we were 50 years ago before we joined the EU. The uh, diaspora has maintained its ties to Ireland. The somewhat outdated Rose of Tralee competition with its contestants from all over the world demonstrates the proud Irish communities across the globe but also the tension between the traditional view of Ireland, which it originally portrayed, and the attempts to be more inclusive in recent years. Although we can sometimes be unfairly, dismiss unfairly dismissive of the Irish diaspora, as we can see with terms such as plastic paddy, we are happy to benefit from it all the same. One such example is our annual trip to Capitol Hill. Indeed, we are the only country in the world with a standing invitation to the White House every single year. From the day that Henry Ford was persuaded to build his car manufacturing plant in Cork to today, we have leveraged this soft power to attract investment in Ireland, and much of our modern prosperity arises directly from our success in this regard. The impact of that soft power cannot be underestimated, and it goes far beyond one slightly bizarre, but nonetheless state-of-the-art service station off the M7. I don't think any other country in the world would even consider naming a petrol station after a US president. Joe Biden, of course, is fiercely proud of his Irish heritage, as many of his predecessors were. However, the fact that the St. Patrick's Day tradition is maintained, even by those with no particular affinity for Ireland, demonstrates the soft power of the Irish diaspora. Another example of that soft power was in the first years of the Trump regime, when sanctions were introduced against Russia. They were also impacted 
They were also impacting many other European states, which a cynic might see as an added benefit from a US perspective rather than an unintended consequence. At a time where there was virtually no bipartisan cooperation in Washington, the Irish Embassy was able to engage with Irish American politicians to negotiate amendments to the regime with a view of avoiding potentially disastrous consequences for Ireland's largest manufacturing facility, the aluminium refinery in Limerick. These are just a handful of the examples, uh, these are just a handful of examples of the value we derive and the influence we assert on the world stage. This influence and this value is so disproportionate relative to our size because of the uniquely transnational nature of Irish identity. Furthermore, in a post-colonial world, being Irish may carry less negative connotations in many parts of the world than other white European ancestry identities. Ireland is seen as another victim of colonialism. And while after over 800 years of oppression at the hand of British imperialism, that is absolutely true, our relationship with colonialism is much more complicated than that. In fact, many Irish people have been complicit in have benefited and profited from and have actively participated in the colonisation, degradation and oppression of indigenous people in other British colonies. Ireland's colonial legacies go far beyond George Barclay and even far beyond Trinity. Huge and other disproportionate numbers of Irish people played a significant role in colonialism abroad, whether as soldiers, settlers, missionaries or governors. However, their role tended to be subsumed and cr credited to the British. I completed my undergraduate dissertation last year on the role of the Irish in colonial New Zealand and one interesting discovery was that while we celebrated certain Irish figures for what we saw as their distinguished careers as soldiers, politicians and diplomats, those same individuals were often seen in a far more negative light in modern New Zealand, primarily because their careers have been revaluated in the light of their treatment of the Maori population. Interestingly, such unpopular individuals, because they were servants of the British Crown, tended to be seen as English or British in New Zealand rather than Irish, whereas the much smaller numbers of Irish people who did champion the cause of the Maori were more readily remembered as Irish in their own lives and today. Accordingly, there is a helpful tendency to overlook the actual Irish contributions to colonialism, such as that of Dwyer, the Irish officer responsible for the Amritsar massacre in India. The perception of the Irish in parts of the world which have suffered from colonialism may be more charitable than we deserve. At the end of the day, the concept of being Irish means more than geography or genealogy. Cities all over the world boast Irish pubs with names like Murphy's or the Little Temple Bar or Kennedy's. St. Patrick's Day celebrations take place across the globe on March 17th each year. Such phenomena demonstrate the global understanding and appreciation for Irishness as a concept. While Guinness and the colour green may be embarrassingly shallow stereotypes, the affection and influence positively generated by the affinity of the diaspora and their sense of Irishness is incredibly beneficial to Ireland. While we can take pride in what we have achieved as modern Ireland, perhaps the time has come to redefine our Irishness. We are no longer a land of saints and scholars, but can we reaffirm our values as an Ireland of a thousand welcomes, being fair and inclusive when we deal with refugees and migrants, especially those from war-torn regions like Ukraine and Palestine, or fleeing economic catastrophes or the disastrous effects of global warming to which we have also contributed. Nor should we forget to be a fairer society to those born on this island, irrespective of gender, religion, race or socio-economic background. So what is Irishness? What makes someone Irish? Being Catholic doesn't seem important anymore, if indeed it ever was, so let's scratch that. Being white obviously isn't. You'd be hard-pressed hard to find a true Irish person who'd say Phil Linnett or Paul McGrath weren't 100% Irish. In spite of the 27th Amendment, Irishness is something bigger than citizenship, religion or ethnicity. I think the Irish people are people who, have, who live or have lived in Ireland, whether born here or having just arrived. We are people that are good crack, that cheer against, the, against England and football, and most importantly, despite colonialism, or despise colonialism and stand with the underdog. There's increasing talk of ending Ireland's neutrality, of becoming part of a European military. But as a small nation with a powerful diaspora, perhaps we can contribute more by being a voice for human rights, by speaking up for the dispossessed, the victims of racism or gender discrimination and violence or any discrimination and violence, and by opposing genocide and human rights abuses wherever they may occur. We've seen the reaction of the US and many other European states to Gaza, not only failing to speak up, but actively supporting Israel's offensive assault on Palestinians. Ireland does not belong in coalitions with these states. She should stand with the oppressed as it is they who stood with us when we needed support. Irishness has often been described as an identity that is value-led, and moreover, it has often been described as an identity that we forged from Irish people's marginalization, be that at home as a result of British colonialism, 
or abroad because of the discrimination faced by Irish migrants. Essentially, being Irish means what it does today because our people struggled. And we benefit extensively from that disproportionate influence and airtime we get because of that understanding of Irishness. However, if we are the people we say we are, then surely we have a moral responsibility to use our influence for wider goals rather than just for attracting more multinational corporations to Ireland. Surely we should be encouraging our friends to stop fueling humanitarian crises with their funding and arms. This year alone, tens of thousands of people have been murdered, including huge numbers of innocent civilians and children. It is estimated well over 1.5 million people have been displaced. And acts so barbaric that they can only be described as war crimes are being committed by countries such as Russia, China and Israel. And some of our closest allies are complicit in these acts. Unlike Germany, the UK, the US, we don't have a major arms industry selling to Israel. And we can use our independence and our neutrality to be a force of good as we did during the Cold War. Our leaders are elected to represent us and our interests first and foremost. But in doing so, we can be an independent voice for those suffering from human rights abuses, from the consequences of climate change, and perhaps most pressingly right now, from genocide. If being Irish could be seen as being a voice for social justice and for international cooperation against the scourges of poverty, war, and climate change, then that would be to all our benefit. Creating a more sustainable world for future generations is in everyone's interest, Irish or not. <laughs> Chair, Auditor, Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, allow me to express once again for the record my profound annoyance at the HIST when I was an undergraduate in the 1960s and girls were banned from debating at the HIST. I was particularly keen to debate because I was very shy um, I actually saw two schoolgirls, I see them now in their uniforms coming in, and I want them to particularly hear this. I was very shy, so I wanted to debate. And they wouldn't let me in the hist. They wouldn't let girls debate in the hist. So uh, what I tended to do was go completely blank, so I needed to practice. So what I had to do was I had to go out of Trinity, go across to Earlsford Terrace, which was part of UCD, and take part in the LNH. And that's where I learned some of my debating skills. Imagine it. I mean, just imagine it. So the hist was closed to me, and I was forced, as I say. And uh, so for this, um, you know, I know you're very proud of the hist. It's clear from what the auditor said, you've had a great year and all that. But just remember, there is this murky, misogynist background. Never forget it. <laughs> OK. So. Um, actually, it was remedied very soon afterwards. When girls were allowed in, of course, one of the first auditors was Mary Harney, who can't be with us this evening. And we had a splendid speech from Anya Kennedy, um, our current um, auditor. And uh, I'm actually going to speak to the... Um, 
text rather than thanking the auditor. I, I formally thank the auditor, whatever motion I'm supposed to do. And now I want to speak about the uh, very good choice of topic, um, Irish identity in a globalized 21st century. This evokes another memory. Uh, when I was elected president in 1990, I said on the day of my, um, the day of the actual count, that I would put a light in the window for all of those who'd had to leave Ireland over the decades, whether it was from conflict or economic poverty or sexual orientation or whatever the reason uh, might be. And the extraordinary thing is that that light took a life of its own. It, it actually taught me the power of symbols. Uh, I never got to mention that light when I met the Irish community in the United States or in Canada or in Argentina or in Australia or New Zealand or wherever, because people would always greet me. We know you have a light in the window and how much it matters. And actually, at that time, we didn't care much about um, um, the Irish who emigrated. We didn't have any policies for them. Um, there were very good Irish immigrant centres in many of these countries with large Irish populations, but um, we, we neglected them, as Ivan Boland said in her uh, poem, um, The Emigrant Irish. Um, let me illustrate the depth of feeling uh, triggered by that light with one example that I recall very vividly. Uh, I, I received a request for um, a, a, a famous speaker of the American House of um, Representatives, Tip O'Neill. He wanted to come and visit me. So he came and I brought him into the drawing room and I offered him tea and he said, no, no, before I have any tea, I want to see that light. So we came outside and uh, there were steps and I was looking at the light to show him that it was in the kitchen of our private quarters and you could see it from the public road. And I, was like, and I turned around and there were tears literally rolling down his cheeks. The intensity of that feeling about a light in the window because of his Irishness, because of his desire to be part of a family. So that led me to um, decide in my second address to the two houses of the Oireachtas that I would speak about what I'd learned about this passion of so many Irish who'd left Ireland, perhaps were third or fourth generation even, and yet they felt this intense thing. And I actually coined the word diaspora. It wasn't used. Um, in fact, when I announced that this would be the title of it, there was some press criticism. You know, well, what's that? Um, is that a, and I see nodding there, somebody who remembers it well. Um, and I, I actually asked my father, I said, um, you know, uh, am I right to use a new word when I'm talking? And they said, oh, yes, my father said. Irish people love new words. And anyway, it became uh, more. But I want to fault myself for my passion for the subject because what happened was I addressed the two houses of the Oireachtas. I think a lot of TDs and senators felt this was political territory anyway, and they weren't very pleased that I was choosing it. And secondly, I was full on. I preached my gospel. I spoke with no self-deprecation, no joke, no nothing. And I got very tepid applause from inside the Oireachtas. I mean, people were not so happy to be preached at in that way. And the wonderful thing was that outside, um, it took off, in the, especially in the diaspora. I mean, Ted Kennedy put it on the record of Congress. And um, I, had a, I had a wonderful handwritten letter from a nun some months later. She said, I'm in China. I don't think there's an Irish person within thousands of miles of me, but I've heard that you gave a speech and I felt included. And it was a lovely sense of um, somebody who uh, was cheered up and, and, and made to feel part of this wider Irish uh, family. So my passion for Irish identity remains. I think the Good Friday Agreement was an incredible uh, contribution because it allowed multiple identities in Northern Ireland. And unlike you, um, Madam Auditor, um, I'm actually going to talk about more the internal first on the island when we talk about Irish identity. Um, we had a shared European identity when both parts of the island were members of the European Union. And then we got 
Brexit and how to move forward uh, with Brexit, how to develop and deepen the relationships. And uh, I think it's probably worth thinking about how to create the time and the space and the motivation to really build relationships on this island. And one idea, and I just throw this out as an idea, would be to have a moratorium. I don't think five years would be enough, but a 10-year moratorium, taking the politics out of it, having no question of raising a referendum on either part of the island for 10 years. I think this would clear a space that could be used very creatively. You see, there isn't much movement between this part of the island and Northern Ireland. We don't know beautiful parts of Northern Ireland. Um, we don't have much relationships. There are relationships. Um, there are the relationships um, that still exist under the Good Friday Agreement. There are relationships, for example, between um, law society, medical profession, um, sporting. In fact, the only sport that isn't an all-Ireland sport is soccer. All the other sports are all-Ireland sports. Um, but we haven't actually deepened a sense of really getting to know and hopefully like the other on the other part of the island. Um, we haven't uh, done enough. For example, it could be very good for our climate um, carbon footprint if we had more people holidaying on this island. I know people want to get away from the rain, but the other part of climate warming is that we're going to have hotter summers. So we could spend hotter summers traveling from one end of the island to the other, and as I say, deepening these relationships. There are wonderful festivals, um, uh, music festivals, literary festivals, etc., and they can give a, a good leadership in uh, bringing us together. But uh, we need, um, if we're going to really talk about a rounded, full Irish identity, and you uh, rightly made it a very inclusive idea, which I agree, um, but uh, to have uh, that real full sense of an Irish identity, we need to build relationships and keep building them and keep making sure um, that we're going in the right direction. And now I want to just say a few things about Ireland looking outwards as part of this identity. And obviously, our key relationship is with the European Union, and we are learning to give some leadership there. For example, as uh, our auditor mentioned um, on uh, an example on, on, on Gaza. Um, I would prefer also if we retained our neutrality, which um, only we can really understand, uh, because the world is weaponizing in a very dangerous way at the moment, including weaponizing further nuclear weapons. Uh, we've had recently good climate policy and legislation the problem is implementation. Uh, we're not on track. Uh, the latest I looked, we were on course for about 29% reduction rather than 50% uh, reduction of our carbon footprint by 2030 of our, of our emissions. Um, I just want to say one word as chair of the elders, the group that Nelson Mandela brought together in 2007. Um, the elders believe that what the world needs to deal with what we call three existential threats, the climate and nature crisis, the um, uh, pandemic crisis, because we haven't learned from COVID. We still have not prepared for the next pandemic. And it will, they say, it will come, and we're not prepared. And the nuclear weapons crisis. And across all three, the role, for better or worse, of artificial intelligence. Long view leadership, briefly, means actually addressing and trying to resolve problems at a collective level with collective responsibility. Um, doing it based on evidence and reason. And thirdly, listening to everybody affected so that um, the decision um, is one that um, is appropriate to the occasion. And uh, having spoken about the elders, I'm going to end uh, with um, a quote that I've used more than once of the second chair of the elders, Kofi Annan. Archbishop Tutu was our first chair. And Kofi Annan had a favorite expression that he would use. He would say, you are never too young to lead, and you are never too old to lead.
to learn. And now, whatever I was to do with the motion, I propose it. Is that okay? <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> I have my notes. <laughs> let me say, uh, I have read a little bit about him. This is a very special person. He has a very special perspective on Irish identity, and I look forward very much uh, to your contribution to us this evening. Good evening, Margaret. A hard job to say, he knew that the Ahas Augustan wrote on down there, and they glowed live. And you, Igor, uh, called uh, on on special day uh, on shot a clash in the Trinoda. Um, Chair, auditor, excellencies, members of the HIS and um, members of the audience, it's an absolute pleasure to be here speaking to you today. I'd like to express my thanks uh, to the HIS and to uh, the auditor, Annie Kennedy, for inviting me here to speak to you today. Uh, and also, if I can say, what an honour it is uh, to speak um, and, or to, to share a podium with. Um, former President uh, and UN High Commissioner for Human Rights, uh, Mary Robinson, alongside uh, amazing uh, fellow speakers, uh, Professor Philip Lane and Derval MacDonald. Um, to be honest, I also wish they would have allowed me to speak first, <laughs> uh, because I feel like everything I want to say has been said already, uh, particularly by Anya. Um, but look, here we go. We'll give it a, a good bash anyways. Um, this topic interests me and excites me for a number of, of reasons. It's this course like this that brings us forward as a society and I suppose allows us to both reflect on what has been and discuss and dream about what can be as well. The theme of Irish identity in a globalised 21st century is something that fascinates me on many levels. On a personal and community level as I've had my own, I suppose, dilemmas with um, identity and my Irish identity and also from a community point of view from the organisation Black and Irish which, which I run. Um, it's funny because if you had asked me uh, a little under 10 years ago when I was 20 if I'd ever be in Trinity College speaking about identity, I would have laughed you out the door for two reasons. The first being um, because I had a first unsuccessful attempt at trying to get into Trinity through the CAO. Um, I won't hold that against you as I hold many things against you but not that. Um, and the second being because at that time I was really struggling with my identity and what it meant to be an Irishman. So I'll primarily speak about identity and then uh, follow up with a piece around globalization and how we can reconcile the two. Um, I suppose so with that I might start with my, my personal journey with identity and what it, it, it's been like for, for me as, as a black Irish man. Um, I, I feel that might give a little bit of context to, to some of the pillars that I want to, to, to speak about later. Um, I'm a mixed race man born to a white Irish Catholic mother and a black Islamic uh, Senegalese father, so as you can imagine, there's many uh, religious uh, celebrations throughout the year, which is a little bit difficult to keep track of. Um, and both, both of my parents actually were, were quite religious. Um, so, you, you know, having Christmas and Ramadan around the same time was, you know, a fun one. But ultimately, having uh, or, or coming from a dual cultural household came with its pros and cons. Some of the pros being that I, I think it gave me a better understanding um, of different people from a younger age and it allowed me to build my, I, I suppose, empathy skills fr from a younger age. Some of the cons would have been that at times I was a little bit confused. Um, both of my parents had different, I suppose, value sets and that would have led them to deal uh, with issues in, in, in different ways and that ultimately led me to being a little bit confused at times. Externally though, um, I found that being mixed race came with a set of challenges which tested my identity um, at various points throughout my, my childhood, my adolescence and er, er, early adulthood. I fell into the stereotypical trope of not white enough uh, or black enough for either side, or to more accurately put it, I positioned myself that way. I allowed the jibes, slurs and stereotypes from white people and the quips, side eyes and reluctance of acceptance from black people to determine how I pre perceived and position myself in the world. This in turn affected my attitudes and behaviours and ultimately this in turn affected my self-confidence and self-esteem. 
The two halves of me were in constant conflict and did not allow a moment's rest. I sought, appro I sought approval um, from others and would often hide parts of myself in order to be accepted. At one point, I tried to entirely disconnect myself from one side of my heritage, which ultimately led to a complete identity crisis. It was one night when I was replaying that battle that I had played over and over again, over a thousand times in my mind, that I said enough was enough. The game of tug of war had to end. I was no longer taking part in this game of diminishing myself. I envisioned myself walking up to the rope and cutting it with a big pair of scissors. It was actually quite a funny image now that I'm, I'm thinking about it. Uh, having a big jumbo pair of scissors. Um, from that day onwards, I was no longer half and half, or half this and half that, and all, you know, half. I was 100% of everything that I am. And that, from that day, I've been able to build my self-confidence, build my self-esteem, and which has in turn enabled me to help others to build their identity. Um, this is ultimately why I went on and started the organization Black and Irish, which is shared hundreds of stories over the last few years and gathered tens of thousands of followers. And that, what, what that showed was, in 2020, when I founded the organization, there was an appetite for people to share their stories and talk about their Irishness. And there was an appetite for people to listen and for people to learn as well, which I, I, I think is really important. In the mosaic of Irish identity in the 21st century, the perspective of black Irish individuals adds depth and complexity, enriching the narrative with layers of diversity, intersectionality, and belonging. The Black and Irish community is resilient and having its identity challenged and facing concerning levels of racism on a day by day can, can be tough and it can chip away at you but ultimately it is a resilient community and we are establishing ourselves and, and, and our identity. So that is a little bit about my personal challenge with, um, with my Irish identity and, and, and how I went on to I suppose find myself and be more open with myself, more kind to myself, and ultimately show that I have resilience. And that's something that's reflected throughout the Black and Irish community now in, in, in Ireland. Those are some of the ways that I have been um, interested in this topic, but there are other ways as well. I'm interested in, in this topic from a historical point of view, from a philosophical point of view, from a moral point of view, and from a logistical point of view as well. So from a historical sense, it, it, it's important that we know where we have come from to know where we're going. We can only connect the dots looking backwards. And it was only by looking back on Irish history and our, recent, and our recent history that I was able to determine what it means to be Irish to me. So in Ireland, we, we've had many tests and challenges of our identity as well. We saw our potato crop fail despite us working the land tirelessly. tirelessly. We experienced forced hunger. We saw our population half, either through perishing or emigrating for a better life. Under colonialism, our language was almost erased, and we had to fight to stop our culture and our freedom from being wrestled from us. Under the Catholic Church, we shamed those who were vulnerable and punished them by isolating them and separating them from loved ones. We are a nation that has seen wave after wave of new people come to Ireland to try and settle. Any true Irish person who understands this will truly understand our identity. An Irish person who understands their identity will form attitudes and behaviours congruent with their history, aligned with their ancestors who had to flee and experience discrimination, humiliation and fear. An Irish person who understands why we had to have head schools will resonate the importance of keeping our culture alive. From a moral and philosophical point of view, it is these histories that I ruminate on from time to time that help me to form what Irishness means to me. I understand my Irish ancestors tile the land, so I respect it and I respect the earth. I'm aware my Irish ancestors had to flee in order to survive, so I see the refugee as my brother, and I am my brother's keeper. I know my ancestors face humiliation and discrimination, so I engage with kindness and empathy. I know my ancestors face persecution for trying to keep their culture alive, so I try to keep it alive and engage with it as much as, much as possible. I support those who also try to keep it alive. A closed culture to me is a dead culture. So I open it to as many people who will listen and welcome them with open arms. I also respect other cultures and their desire to keep them alive. We know what it is to be shamed and made to feel guilty despite there being no reason for it. So I show empathy before I judge. We have seen wave after wave 
of new settlers come to Ireland despite, and despite that our language and culture and our ability to be open and welcoming has survived. This installs faith in me that the Irish culture is resilient and can withstand tests like what we are seeing today. I know the true Irish culture will prevail. It is these values of openness, kindness, empathy, courage and resilience that make us truly Irish in the 21st century. Many new black and Irish people hold these values close, to their own, uh, close due to their own experiences. All communities in Ireland, regardless of being born here or coming here, who hold these values close to them are Irish. Regardless of skin colour, ethnicity, religion, gender or sexuality, what makes you Irish is who you are on the inside. I'm going to speak about globalisation now and the impact that it's having and it is something that we will need to really come to grips with and adapt if we are, I believe, to survive as a species. Globalisation is a force that we must adapt to if we are to overcome the challenges of tomorrow. With access to new cultures and communities can come conflict and competition for resources. This can also bring about opportunities which I believe outweigh the challenges. The opportunity to collaborate with new minds is what should excite us the most. If we can rectify the conflicts and ensure people have what they need in order to not have to compete, we can collaborate more and get the best from humanity. W.E.B. Du Bois once said, the world is shrinking and races and cultures will collide. What we must try and bring about through healthy globalization is that when this collision occurs, what sea change do we get? Conflict or collaboration? The Irish identity and way of life can become a guiding beacon of hope in this global turmoil. I believe Ireland can become a global leader in the field of equality, inclusion and belonging, and that other countries can learn from us. From this small, from this small island, we really can change the world. So to close, I would like to again express my thanks for being invited to speak to you all today. The Irish identity should not be built on features, but instead be rebuilt on foundational values. Those are the values of empathy, openness, respect, kindness and resilience. Despite the challenges, we have massive opportunities to become a global leader in equality and inclusion. Once we begin to overcome our current challenges, greater challenges may show themselves, like the challenges of climate change and artificial artificial intelligence and challenges to democracy. However, we will face them together. Ninyartika Kurlakela Guramina Mahagwiv. And with that, I would like to second the motion that the thanks of the society are due to the auditor for her paper. Thank you. Good evening. So I'm very happy to propose this motion uh, and I think it's sufficient uh, to take tonight's event uh, as a motivation for that. So let me congratulate the auditor for an excellent uh, uh, address and also let me 
zero in uh, on the nature of the, of the uh, topic tonight. Because w w when uh, Anya contacted me, I was intrigued by, by, by the, the nature, Irish identity in a globalized 21st century. And uh, I haven't asked her, uh, but, but there might be a question, okay, why invite an economics professor uh, to, to take on this topic? And my, my bottom line in the end is essentially the world of economics at this point globally has basically concluded that behind the surface of, of economics, the deep questions in the world are really about uh, identity and how societies are successful or not successful, which are very intertwined. And I would also say, uh, of course, uh, we, we can think about identity in many ways. We think about, can, about how identity is articulated by, by in the arts, in, in cultural activities. But, you know, I'm a bit more of a, a practical person. We can also think about it in, in terms of the, the, the society we build, the institutions we develop. Uh, and this is where Irish identity in the 21st century, globalized 21st century, is very interesting because Ireland really, it's very hard to find other examples which has, has the same context as Ireland, uh, as uh, the auditor said in her speech. And we all know this, for, for a long time, even through the uh, mid-1990s, I was a student here in the late 80s, early 90s, the context was just chronic emigration. Chronic emigration uh, for a long time, and of course, uh, the first thing I did in 1991 is I left. So, so uh, you know, I spent the 90s, uh, most of it in, in the United States. And of course now, uh, uh, w for the last, uh, you know, 30 years essentially, we, we now have the, the, the fact that many people, Irish people returned, and we have many uh, people who, who live and work here from all around the world. And maybe it's noteworthy and striking um, uh, w w with uh, the contribution of Mary Robinson, we of course have many diasporas here now. And I, actually when I you know, move around Europe, I keep on meeting people to say, oh yeah, my cousin, my uncle, uh, my nephew, they're working in Ireland. So you know, there's a Croatian diaspora here, there's a Polish diaspora here, every country in Europe and of course around the world. Uh, there are those uh, little communities here. And of course people have multiple identities, Mary Robinson, here in this country has been very, I think, uh, successful in emphasizing it's not a, a either or. Uh, you can be Irish and also maintain your, 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 your cultural background. And of course, in America, as, as Mary Robinson identified with the Tip O'Neill story, uh, of course, there's very, very many striking examples where people really do uh, maintain uh, both identities. Maybe I would also say what's maybe also uh, relevant now is of course in this world, uh, despite uh, some of the, the climate costs of it, many people work in one place and live in another place. There's lots of commuting between here and uh, London, lots of commuting between here and Frankfurt where I am at the ECB. Okay, so, so the identity, and I'll come back in the end to identity, but let me add in the globalization uh, element. And in fact, my, my academic career was built on the study of globalization. And economically, we think about globalization of the economy through trade, globalization of, of finance, that essentially global investors uh, have the world uh, to, to allocate uh, across, globalization of technology, uh, something invented here can roll, be rolled out around the world, something of course invented in America or in China can be rolled out here. Uh, and uh, I think today, a, a lot of the uh, theme tonight is about globalization of, of populations, migration, which is you know, really a, a very big topic. Uh, and uh, by the way, the economics uh, consensus is the biggest transformation in the world is through migration. Uh, and of course, uh, this is one of the biggest uh, political issues. But maybe I'll mention, uh, in the end, uh, all of those uh, elements are maybe, uh, you have to set aside, you know, side by side with, with basically the shared uh, uh, planet we live on and that, whether that's this shared responsibility for, for 
uh, reversing uh, global warming, uh, shared responsibility for global public health, to name just two, and of course, uh, global security. Okay, so where does that bring me? It brings me to the fact what the world just chronically is, is struggling with is how do we run a globalized uh, world? What is the role of the nation state, which in the end is the most important organizational unit? What is the role of the European Union? And uh, by the way, uh, 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 you know, uh, via the European Central Bank, the European Union uh, is quite advanced in, in that dimension. And what is the role of global organizations, which really amounts uh, to, to the various uh, branches of the UN? And this is really, I think, a fundamental issue. And of course, because uh, democracies are basically national in nature, we, we have not, you know, I don't see any near-term scope to really have participatory democracy beyond the, nation, the nation state. This brings us to what is, is, is the role of the nation state? How do we have a successful nation state? And how does that interact with identity? Because the, the paradox of globalization is in fact, more than ever, the nation state is essential. You might say in a globalized world, what do I care about the, the local nation? Uh, my, I work for a multinational. My, my, day, my day is spent with other people in that multinational organization. Or my culture through the internet, it, my, my online culture is some global community, not some local community. But in the end, uh, globalization uh, can be uh, very extensive in terms of technology, in certain terms of some types of the economy, but most of the time uh, you live in your neighborhood. Most of the time uh, you care very much about uh, where you live in terms of housing. You care very much about the health care your elderly parents receive. You care very much about the education your kids receive. So in the end, a lot of uh, your, your happiness and your success depends on how good is the nation state, how good is the municipal government for that matter. And this is where uh, the identity comes in. When people look at this around the world, it is so intertwined with a strong sense of national identity. Essentially, if you don't uh, have a shared value. Someone mentioned values tonight. I think you mentioned values. Um, if you don't have a shared identity with the other people in, in the nation state, uh, politics tends to descend into conflict, zero-sum distributional struggle, as opposed to trying to build a, a collectively enhancing uh, uh, society. And it's, it's very important uh, in this world if we want to take advantage of globalization, that we have well-educated people, we have healthy people, uh, we have the infrastructure to do well under globalization. So the paradox of globalization is it makes the local more important. If you have a successful nation state, then it can become more successful because essentially that nation state will attract global investment that nation state, uh, it's the people who leave will come back. That nation state, will, it will invite migration. And the, and the offset of that is if you have a society not working well, and earlier on you mentioned about the dark side of Ireland. Many people left in the 60s, 70s, 80s, partly for economic reasons, partly because they did not want to live in that country. And so if you have an unsuccessful country, you get what's called a doom loop. People leave, they vote with their feet, then that country functions less well, they cannot afford, because it's getting smaller, they cannot afford to run the country, and you can have a, basically a slow-moving implosion. And Ireland is one of the few examples which has reversed that dynamic. So uh, maybe I'm uh, meandering here, but my basic point here is, I think the, the ingredients are success in the globalization world, Needs a, needs a successful society and government. And I think the only way you have that is with a strong sense of shared identity. That is not a given. You can't be lazy about it. You have to build it. Um, and let me say uh, that, that Ireland has a, a lot of uh, 
possibilities here. Uh, if you look at indicators around the world, people report a very strong sense of community engagement in Ireland. Compared to many places, there is a platform of strong communities. Um, and I think that, that that is very important. And maybe I would also, as a side comment, say, this is also goes hand in hand with promoting solidarity elsewhere. Uh, if, if we want to avoid an unstable world, we want to promote successful societies elsewhere. So international solidarity across the EU, uh, globally, especially in Africa, I think is quite important. Okay, let me finish by just coming back to, to uh, the European level. So I said that uh, we can't really have global government. Uh, I think the UN is essential. It has to do what it can do. But in the end, it's too distant from uh, electorates to be able to do very much. The European Union uh, is essentially, uh, there's a big agenda. Sometimes uh, it makes sense to cooperate. Sometimes uh, it makes sense to retain national independence. But in the area of finance, the, the, the creation of the, of the single currency 25 years ago was really uh, quite a step. And what I would say is in terms of the ability of Europe to deal with the globalization challenges in, in finance, uh, having the single currency I think has proven successful. And uh, what's maybe interesting, and maybe I don't know if I could take a poll here tonight what you would answer, is whether having the single currency has also enhanced European identity. I mean, I, that's our impression. When we look around Europe, the fact that we share a common currency is really, uh, and this is the intention, by the way, those who created the single currency ultimately did it to build political ties across Europe. Not political in the sense of maybe just having the same nation state, but to have a, a shared identity. And let me come back to the reason why a shared identity at the European level is so important is uh, the euro was created in the 1990s, about 50 years after World War II but very much in the shadow of Europe has seen so much war, so much disruption over the centuries. Having a peaceful Europe is so important. And this is why what we see uh, in, in Ukraine is, is so disturbing. So maybe uh, with that, I, I'll stop. What I've tried to indicate to you is uh, that the world of economics, the world of, of identity, where it meets, is in how identity translates into policy making, how identity translates into the kind of society we build. And of course, uh, this is something um, every day, every year uh, we have to work on. So with that, let me thank again the auditor for the invitation uh, and I'll stop there. Thank you very, very much. Um, I promise not uh, to sing. Uh, Mr Chairman, Madam Auditor, uh, Your Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen of the College Historical Society, ladies and gentlemen, it is an incredible privilege, if not a very, very daunting one, for this former debates convener of the Dublin University Law Society uh, to come home to Trinity to address you this evening. I breathed with relief when I heard Amir Robinson talk about going completely blank because in third year, um, I, it may have involved actually uh, debating against Adrian Langan, I think it was in the Mace Observer, the Irish Times, I blanked during a debate and did not speak in public again for close to 10 years. So it's actually quite daunting for me to come back uh, to debate um, at home. Um, 
Crossing the front square this evening, I was reminded of one of the most intriguing questions we used to ask each other uh, when you first come in through those doors in Trinity. The question, what school did you go to, uh, usually came nanoseconds after the question, where do you come from? And it took me a little bit of a while uh, to, to realise that the answer to that question, what school did you go to, um, was potentially relevant um, because it could denote social class or status, um, whether or not you attended a fee-paying school uh, and whether you're not like me, you were likely to be receiving a grant. Of course, the question, what school did you go to, had huge resonance in my native Northern Ireland, because the answer to that then or now typically answered the question as to whether you were a Catholic or a Protestant, although Derville from Newry sort of usually sorted that one out for me. But that's what we do when it comes to identity. We put each other in boxes, we assign difference, we engage in othering, the them and the us. As a young person growing up at the height of the Troubles in Northern Ireland, I leaned heavily into my Irishness. Um, I was born pre-internet, so my parents knew the anglicised version of my name, D-E-R-V-A-L, and as a young person, I changed that to Dervil, to the Irish uh, spelling of it. Um, I uh, took the chance to learn Irish at school, uh, which was a surprise to many people when I came down here, um, and I always, uh, then as now, travelled on an Irish uh, passport. Um, much like Derry Girls, it was in culture, in my love of music and theatre, um, where I was able to transcend those differences, where I found my tribe, uh, where I met Protestants, actually, quite, uh, quite honestly, when I was uh, playing in orchestras um, on stage. And it was wonderful uh, that it was in those places that we could really transcend our difference, if only for a time. But it did prompt um, a lifelong passion of mine for conflict resolution um, through creativity and the arts what Anya has already mentioned, that soft power that we um, excel at. Identity is formed from a very, very early age. I remember being in primary school, somebody asked me, was I a cup or a plate? Not knowing, of course, what the answer really meant to that Catholic or Protestant in those early ages. Um, identity shaped every single aspect of my childhood and adolescence growing up in Northern Ireland, and it still does. Coming to Trinity in 1996 was intoxicating, not least because there were so many Northerners, so many people like me on campus, but not so much, not anymore. And actually, the lack of students from Northern Ireland crossing the border to come to third level education is really, really, really worrying. Um, but at that stage, 96, uh, we didn't really possibly realise it at the time. Uh, we were only two years away, and that big, big turning point in the Good Friday Agreement. Peace hadn't seemed possible um, to us before then. The agreement was, and I've said this very, very many times, an extraordinary act of scenario planning. It saw around many, many corners, demography, um, consent, identity, the one curveball that it did not predict, which was Brexit, which was a crisis, I think, very much of English nationalism and identity. We don't possess um, a singular or a pure identity. There's no such thing as 100% Irish. We have many sub-identities, but the French celebrate as la différence, our discordance, our otherness, or our diversity. If you splice me into little pieces, you'll find out that I'm an Irish woman from Northern Ireland who is European, who supports Darren or Armagh, depending on who's winning the championship, and a woman who has spent as much time attending games in Windsor Park as I have in Croke Park. Identity matters, but as, as Philip has said, it's not a zero-sum game. Like states and constitutions, identity evolves. It's not fixed for all time. And that's what makes the creation of common community or national identities a very, very dynamic and a challenging thing to craft. This I learned in the years after the agreement, whose magical elixir, as Mary Robinson um, reminded us, allowed us to stand down those primal forces of identity. Recognising the complexity of people's identities, it allowed people like me to identify themselves and to be accepted as Irish or British or both, as well as to hold the right to British or Irish citizenship or both. That was an incredible gift. It was a liberation to us. It gave us permission to hold space for the other, to appreciate them as well as us. And I can stand before you tonight and with a fair degree of confidence say that I'm an Irish woman from Northern Ireland and that I am Irish British in the same way as someone might say they're Irish American or Irish Italian. And you might think, well, so what? You might think, what's so big about that? For you who have lived your lives, thankfully, the generation that came after us in peace. But that is significant because there was a time where I may have been tarred and feathered for saying as much. 
And that is really, really extraordinary for us to be able to lean into that experience. Identity matters because wanting to belong, it lies at the heart of our human experience. And throughout our lives, we continually search and try and devise ways and means of organising ourselves socially, politically, culturally, in search of that identity and belonging. The personal is at once political, but it has always been thus. Identity has the power to both unite and divide us, and as we've heard, is informing tectonic shifts politically and socially around the globe, mostly, but not always, accompanied, as Professor Lane has identified, by economic forces, both good and bad. Identity is the driving force in contemporary politics, from religion to race, gender, sexuality, language, culture, and ethnicity. It's the driving force behind populism, independence movements, climate denialism, and critically, the growth sadly, the growth of fascist movements worldwide. And Philip is right when he said that context matters, economics matters, demography matters, peace matters, prosperity matters. We are still processing, I believe, the long tail of the 2008 global financial crisis, which inaugurated a decade, if not more, of austerity that has widened into a perilous income gap. Europe itself is grappling with a growing productivity and competitive crisis and people may have seen today the reports the EU leaders meet tonight of Enrico Letta's report on um, the need for further integration in Europe, he has argued, especially in the areas of financial services, of energy um, and of telcos to ward off the risk of um, uh, risking Europe's um, uh, I suppose social and economic security. There's factors like declining um, birth rates in Europe, which, like many developed regions, is facing slowed economic growth as a result of an ageing po pop population. That's a factor that's actually driving identity crises in Europe, as well as other regions, including the US, where the great replacement debate has now become mainstream. Um, Europe, absent the power of its finding myth, and with the Ukraine war still lingering and engulfing the continent, aggravating what a, what the global and eco, our energy and cost of living crisis, has also seen the rise of fire movements all across Europe, and of course Ireland is not immune to those trends. A little note, if I may, on um, globalisation, so eloquently set out by Anya and my colleagues here tonight. Um, for decades, modern democratic theory has celebrated globalisation, multiculturalism, pluralism and tolerance, the ability for mature societies to hold and celebrate multiple identities. And it's true that the free flow of ideas, people, good, services and capital across national borders has led to greater economic integration and, for the most part, prosperity. Globalisation, probably since before I was born, has been the defining feature of the global um, economy. But I think we're experiencing something of a perfect storm of forces, including uh, the, the Ukraine war um, and further conflicts, the financial crisis, migration, um, changing populations, populism, post-colonialism, as Leon um, identified, independence as well as the pandemic. All of these have revealed the fragility of the construct of globalisation. And in fact, actually, when you look back at it, uh, globalisation is, is itself not a static thing. It has ebbed and flowed over many decades. But we are experiencing fragmentation at present, at present that is threatening to unravel the integration that has proved the lives and the livelihoods of billions of people across the, the globe. I don't know what the proper uh, 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 technical term is, uh, Philip, but some would say that we're actually in a, in a process of globalisation um, at the moment. And it's true that the world, it feels, is tilting right. And globalisation is a huge factor in that. And it comes at a time when we are seeing the intensification of the core drivers of displacement, geopolitics, technology, and climate, to name a few. Leon invited us to, um, to look back in order to look forward. And I think that's a really, really interesting thing to do. Since 2012, we've been celebrating or commemorating the decade of centenaries. Um, and 75 years ago this week, um, Ireland became a republic. Earlier today, the minister, um, she was minister for many things, but we'll go for culture uh, for, for the purpose of this conversation, Catherine Martin, opened a new exhibition just off the road in the Coach House in Dublin Castle, um, which captures the nascent independent Ireland. Uh, the exhibition comes ahead of the release in 2026 of the, uh, from the National Archives of the 1926 census. And this was the first sort of comprehensive accounting of the Irish state that had so recently at that time just come into being. Um, that first census, that first kind of primary census of the Irish Free State, gave the government of the day a picture 
of Ireland and its people, helping to support the government planning for citizens in the decades that lay ahead. And that census, which occurred every 10 years after 1926, bore witness to the evolution of the Irish state. From newfound freedom to after centuries of British rule, to increasing liberalisation uh, and to the emergence of the so-called economic tiger. And what it witnessed was from emigration to economic growth, from free secondary education, probably one of the most significant things to have happened on the island. But the 20th century witnessed transformative improvements in public services in Ireland, as well as momentous social and cultural changes. And I think what that retrospective shows is that Ireland's national story, its identity, has not still, uh, stood still. It has been evolving over time. And it's interesting um, to think, well, what have the last 30 years done? What does the more recent data tell us about what is forging and shaping our identity? I think the last 30 years have shown that we have adorned many identities and shed even more. The 1990s witnessed, um, which is when I was coming here into Trinity, witnessed the collision of three tectonic plates that are still shaping the course of Irish history the Celtic Tiger, the peace process, and the decline of the Catholic Church. And in the 1990s, it was strange that all of those three phenomena uh, came together, but the tide began to change on so many fronts. We got unprecedented prosperity, and for the first time, we were a destination for migrants. And historically, as everyone has spoken to, such a big part of our DNA, so many millions left, and we now have a diaspora of more than 70 million with I think 30 million people in the United States of America identifying um, as, as Irish. Ireland isn't full, by the way. Um, our population um, plummeted in 1961. But now what our latest uh, uh, census shows is that we're still not, even since 1871, we're still only tilting at pre-famine levels of population. That is not a bad story. That is an extraordinary success story, I would argue, um, for this island. Um, yes, um, Ireland is not immune to... Um, we have been immune largely to right-wing populism. Um, and we are a country that is being remoulded and reimagined by immigration. I would argue that... We are not full, but actually what we do have is a housing crisis. We have a density problem, we have a spatial planning problem and many aligned things. But really what that speaks is to the underlying issues of the uh, societal problems, whether it's housing, healthcare, that we're already you know, experienced. And of course, that has to uh, be managed. It was really, really, really interesting to hear the Madam Water talk about is a time you know, to redefine our Irishness. But the reality is, is that we're doing that all of the time. And it was interesting, so interesting, listening to President Robinson talking about the prospect of a moratorium for 10 years. Because in one sense, we have come full circle. We've gone from partition and poverty to prosperity and the prospect of Irish unity. I do share, as someone who comes from Northern Ireland, whose Irishness is still very othered, um, even though I spent more of my life living in the Republic of Ireland than I did in Northern Ireland, um, I worry about how we manage that conversation because the tr greatest tragedy of partition is, as Mary Robinson correctly identified, is that we still do not know each other. And I've spoken many times to, to and interviewed people who are involved in the peace process, one of whom was former Taoiseach Bertie O'Hearn, who said that probably the greatest challenge in a unity debate is not what will happen in Northern Ireland where it's very, very interesting in terms of if you look at the trends, who identifies as Irish or British or Northern Irish. I believe that the biggest challenge will be south of the border because we still do not know enough about each other. And if the recent debates on the economic cost um, of a potential United Ireland and the dismissal of Northern Ireland as some sort of you know, social welfare state that wouldn't be welcome here worries me, I have to say, in the extreme. I think when we tear behind the... The, the unity debate and get into the really deep cultural things like flags, like uh, emblems. Are we ready south of the border to accept that more than one million people on the island of Ireland in the event of unity have a right to British citizenship, have, uh, are going to be British citizens? How do we accommodate that? How do we make them feel welcome? What excites me um, is the fact that the future is not going to be binary, in a, particularly in respect of the unity debate. When we look at the recent census data, particularly in the Republic of Ireland, when we look at 20% of the workforce not being born here, when it comes to the question of unity, 
It may not necessarily be decided along traditional Catholic and Protestant lines or uh, anything of that order. And that really, really, really excites me because I don't think the future is binary. And I think there are better ways for us to realise the ambition of this place that we uh, can call home. And that includes our fantastic black and Irish uh, community who are not sufficiently, I'll speak against my own profession, who are not sufficiently represented on our airwaves in our newsprint. There is a big, big conversation ahead to come. I'll finish up by, um, by channeling that great Persian mystic, uh, Rumi, who gives us a good guide, I think, to what it might be like when we come to consider our Irishness. Out beyond ideas of wrong wrongdoing and right doing, there is a field. I'll meet you there. When the soul lies down in that grass, the world is too full to talk about. Ideas, language, even the phrase, each other, doesn't make any sense. So it is my absolute privilege to second the motion and my deepest thanks to, to you all for allowing me to speak tonight. <laughs> In fact, it's been continuous uh, with our history, really. And it, it's not that that should be unique. It's not unique to us. Identity is a problem. Because identity, in the first instance, is very personal, as was mentioned, and has been of great personal importance to all of us, and particularly spoken about beautifully by our speakers this evening. But if personal identity becomes destructive, and we know how that can be, and becomes antisocial instead of communal, then we run into very, very serious difficulties. I'm just going to mention a few things that uh, maybe some of you don't know about. Until 1970, Catholics could not enter Trinity College Dublin, not because Trinity didn't want Catholics to come here, but because every Lent, the Archbishop of Dublin read out in his Lenten pastoral a direction to Catholic parents that they should not send their children to Trinity College Dublin on pain of mortal sin. 1970. I mean, we were living in a very, very strange country between, well, we always have been, and it's still pretty strange, uh, and we'll come to that in a minute, but the identity, this, this idea of identity, and the simple fact was that it was an unwritten national policy to repress Protestantism in the Republic of Ireland. Now, that's not been said very often, but I want to assure you that any careful examination of political uh, movement in Ireland between 1922 and the middle to late 1960s was actually directed at decolonization, would be another way of putting it. And it took a long time and a lot of hard work uh, as we gradually moved away from that and then into the wonderful 1970s and 1980s when we began to mature wonderfully as a society. 
and we began to recognize the complexity of identity. And we began to do something which is of huge importance to us worldwide and to us in Ireland today, that is to respect diversity. Diversity in a way, well it is, to my mind, much, much more important than personal identity in the sense that, yes, let's have our personal identities, but we must commit ourselves morally and personally uh, to respecting diversity. Now, I'm a geneticist, and there was a very famous geneticist, William Bateson, who in fact really led the introduction of genetics uh, in these islands. He was active in the early 1900s, and he had a fabulous injunction which I've used over and over again in many different uh, ways. Treasure your exceptions. Don't just tolerate people who are different than you, but try to treasure them, to admire them, to find things in them that are different. I want to know about Senegalese music. I want to know about northern traditions of which we in the south are almost completely and utterly ignorant. And my family, two branches of my family come from the north. But I don't know those, those traditions. And some of them, not all of them, but a lot of them are really fine traditions. Wonderful music, for example, which comes down that line. Wonderful history. 1798 was not led from Wexford. It was led by the United Irishmen of County Down and County Antrim. And a Protestant minister, with an ancestral main, name that I, I am connected with, the Reverend Archibald Warwick, a Presbyterian minister, supporting 1798, was executed in County Down. The complexity of this story is very, very, very great. So, I really enjoyed everything that uh, has been heard this evening. It has, I think, provoked uh, uh, us all stimulated us. I'm left with one word which I think uh, maybe let's, it's a possibility that the word that uh, Dr. Robinson used, she said I think it was the first time that she had used it and the first time that she'd ventured this idea, moratorium. We really must have space to try to repair the damage done by 40 years, more than 40 years of civil war in the north of Ireland. I mean, is it not unimaginable that in a Western European country there was a civil war and it was on this island and 5,000 people approximately died, tens of thousands of people were wounded, huge damage done. A person from the north of Ireland said to me the other day that he thought it might take 50 to 100 years to repair the damage done in that uh, terrible period in, in the north of Ireland. Which, by the way, we can also, I think, strangely enough, and I'll say this uh, rather carefully, it did not descend into mass communal warfare. Huge credit to the people of the north of Ireland that so many of them retained uh, uh, a... Um, retained standards of behavior which said we're not going to get involved, which in Europe within the last 50 years we have seen whole societies go for each other. That did not happen, indicating some great strengths of the society in Northern Ireland. But we have a very, very, very big job to do to somehow accommodate um, the different identities on this island and the new identities which indeed have been mentioned. Now, I think our experience, um, the fact that our, uh, our institutions are very strong, in particular, let me mention uh, the legal system of this country, our constitution in the Republic, the legal system in the north of Ireland. By and large, these systems have been incredibly strong. And they, this leads me to a last comment really, that when we think of identity, and identities we want to identify with, the ones which are most valuable are the ones which are the highest in our society. In other words, which have the most effect, which affect us all. So the legal system in our country affects us all. 
We can identify with that and all the principles that underlie it, the principle of democracy, all the principles of good government, which should be universal. Those are things we can identify with. Our private, personal identity is sometimes incredibly important. I mean, Greystone's rugby club is very important to my grandchildren. You have to be able to identify with your community and the richness of our communities and the diversity of our communities, of our sporting communities, for example. Absolutely wondrous. Let's celebrate all of that, but not so that it becomes divisive, that it can be treasured because it's different. Okay? I don't play hurling. I've never played hurling. I don't. I never did. For goodness sake, I think of playing it now. It is the greatest game on the planet. Everybody knows that. We can all celebrate that hurling is the greatest game on the planet. Everybody can. We can't all participate in it. Luckily, a lot of people, a lot of people do. So in conclusion, I'd like to thank the order for, for her address and to thank her in particular, I think inspired in, uh, in having, uh, in, in, in choosing these two words, identity and globalization. And what, it was so important indeed to hear from Dr. Robinson and from Dr. Lane how many of these problems that we're talking about are identity. It's very clear that this idea that uh, identities have got to lie, the ones who we can uh, share in uh, should guide us all and then let's celebrate at the nation state level, at the municipality level, the great principle of subsidiarity, which is a very strong but little talked about uh, theory of social structure that you pass down uh, decision making uh, as far as you possibly can that is reasonable uh, in society. From the globe to the regional organizations such as the EU, then to the nation states, and then lower and lower down even to the parish level. We must seek to try to, uh, we must try to uh, promote that uh, across the world. So I've talked for far too long, but it, the problem is that I've been so stimulated uh, uh, by a, a great uh, address by the auditor and a fine set of speeches by our visitors for whom I uh, thank you on behalf of the uh, I'd also like to thank several ambassadors who have been kind enough to come this evening and to listen to the College Historical Society at work. Thank you very much.